Welcome to the second hour of Air Checks. The series, inspired by an announcer character on earlier anthology series, premiered on the Mutual Network on September 26, 1937 and ended on December 26, 1954. The 677 episodes aired over 18 seasons, including an additional summer series in the first season. The seasons were of variable length, season 1 through season 8 were of 26 to 30 episodes, season 9 through season 12 were of 38 to 39 episodes, season 13 through season 17 were of 47 to 52 episodes, and the final season 18 was of 22 episodes. There are a number of lost episodes, over 60% of the total, 153 episodes are missing, 6 episodes are incomplete from seasons 1 through 12 and seasons 13 through 18 are entirely missing except for 3 episodes. Radio scripts are available for the series including the missing episodes, except for the season 1 summer series, which is complete in recordings. Some of the missing episodes are available in preserved recordings of a 1940s Australian adaptation and in recordings of recreated stage readings collected by old-time radio enthusiasts. This is a recreation of two of the Shadow episodes. The Ghost Walks Again was originally broadcasted on March 16, 1941 and The Death Triangle was originally broadcasted on December 12, 1937. These two episodes are preserved, but it's nice to know that there is a recreation of the old radio scripts. These two episodes were recreated on September 27, 2015. They're located in the Glittering Arts and Entertainment District in downtown Conroe, Texas, comes the Players Theater Company. Wait, Walt- wait, wait, hold up. Stop, what? stop the show. Stop the show? What are you talking about? We got a live broadcast here. What? what, what, what Sorry, got- Dennis, uh, but there's some information... You need before going on. Um, come here a second. You're kidding. You gotta be kidding me. What are you doing? Interrupting the middle of this thing. I just got going. I got a good just rhythm. Tell, just tell them the new stuff, friend. The new stuff. Yeah. The new. St- what? Is it, that's gotta be really confusing. People are gonna be scratching their heads. This is. Oh, all right. <clears throat> all right. Live from the Owen Theater, located in the Glittering Arts and Entertainment District in downtown Conroe, Texas, comes the Crichton Players Vintage Radio Theater. This is your host, Dennis Nelson. On this, our season premiere. Tonight, we present a favorite double feature from radio's golden age, The Shadow. The character of The Shadow debuted in 1930 as the mysterious narrator of the detective story hour. But the character quickly grew to be more highly regarded than the stories themselves. On radio, The Shadow's alter ego was that of Lamont Cranston, who perfected the secret art of hypnotism after many years in the Far East. This ability allowed him to cast a shadow in the minds of others, thereby rendering him invisible while fighting master criminals and diabolical evildoers. His friend was the smart, alluring socialite Margot Lane, who acted as a partner in crime whenever necessary, but enough backstory, let's get to the meat of the matter. Let's introduce our own star-studded cast. This evening's suspenseful dramas feature a live cast of familiar players alongside some new voices. 
The stellar Belle Ladine joins us as Grace and as Margot Lane in the second half of our program. With us as Martin, please welcome the versatile Stephen Preddies. Talented Landon Edwards stars as Mattis and the Butler. Debonair Baron Dan Jackson will be featured as the Sheriff and as Dr. Evans. The excellent Ken Man plays both Silas and Corvey tonight. And the fantastic Rebecca McDowell stars as Margot Lane in the first half. But she appears as Dubril later in our show. Finally, playing Lamont Cranston, a.k.a. The Shadow, for both episodes, the remarkable Jeff Evans returns tonight. And, and now, without further ado... evil lurks in the hearts of men. The shadow knows. <laughs> the shadow, a man of mystery who strikes terror into the very souls of evildoers everywhere. Lamont Cranston, a man of wealth, a student of science, and a master of other people's minds, who devotes his life to righting wrongs, solving crimes, protecting the innocent, and punishing the guilty, using advanced methods that may ultimately become available to all law enforcement agencies. Cranston is known to the underworld as the Shadow, never seen, only heard, as haunting to superstitious minds as a ghost, as inevitable as a guilty conscience. With his friend and constant companion, lovely Margot Lane, the shadow meets up with danger tonight when the ghost walks again. Night, peaceful night, has fallen on a small New England town. We hear the footsteps of a couple from the town heading toward a village meeting, taking a shortcut through an ancient graveyard, when suddenly... Sam! Yes? Sam, look. Up there, by that big oak. Isn't that a freshly dug grave? Well, now, it certainly looks like one. Odd. That section's been closed off. There have been no burials there in over 200 years. We'd better take a look. Hold the lantern higher, Sam. That's it. Say, that's the grave of Sir Roger Mathis. Now, who could have done that? I don't know, but it's a terrible trick. Desecrating a 200-year-old grave? The grave of the first governor of our colony. Whoever the meddler was should... No meddler desecrated this grave. Who was that? Sam, look. Walking toward us. His clothes are covered with dust. And so old. Knee breeches, powdered hat, Puritan wig. Sam, look at his face. It's like a death mask. It looks like the old pictures of Sir Roger. I am Sir Roger. I have returned from the dead. <gasps> I have returned to save thee and thy village from its sinful ways. It can't be. It can't be. Silence. If either of thee utters word, I shall run thee through with this sword. What shall we do, Sam? Thou shalt do as I command. The will of Sir Roger Mathis is law. To break it means death. Death! Quiet! Quiet! Uh, gentlemen, ladies, the issue that brings us here tonight in this old meeting place, as you all know, it was erected in 1712 by the first governor of this colony, Sir Roger Mathis. And as you also all know, nothing has been disturbed within the walls since that day. The furniture, the paintings, even the ancient punishment stocks and the torture presses are all still in their original places. 
Oh. Now, some members have proposed that uh, this hall, which has always been a private gathering place for the descendants of the first settlers of the village, to be open to the public as a museum and an admission price be charged. Proposition is an outrage. Please, Mr. Crossman. An outrage, I say. They were violating the very laws passed down to us by our founder, Sir Roger Mathers. Someone go into the next room and fetch the original ruling, written in Sir Roger's own hand. You go, Harvey. Yes, sir. I shall read to thee this document, and ye shall see... Oh, no! No! What is it, Harvey? In the press. The ancient torture press. There are two bodies! What? It's Sam and Grace Merrill. They've been crushed to death. There's a note in Sam's hand. It looks like old parchment. What does it say? It's an ancient death warrant signed by Sir Roger Mathis. And it was that night the whole thing started, Mr. Cranston. Oh, that's so gruesome, Lamont. Indeed, Margot. Sheriff, have the state police uncovered anything? Nope. Uh, they're as baffled as we. That's why I sent for you. Has the ghost of Sir Roger been seen since? Uh, yes, Miss Lane, uh, many times. And there's been others that have died by his hand. How many? Uh, three. Uh, one was found in the stocks. Uh, another hanging from the tree that was used just for that purpose in the olden days. And a third was tied to the ancient ducking stool. We found him uh, in the river, uh, drowned. Each one was clutching a parchment death warrant. Have there been any clues at all? Anything that would link these crimes together? Well, uh, everyone who died was uh, in favor of opening the old meeting place to the public. I see. But uh, that only strengthens the people's belief in the ghost of Sir Roger. They say it is his vengeance for pro proposing such a move. Aside from the ghost of Sir Roger... Who is opposed to the opening of the meeting place? Well, uh, quite a few would vote that way. Uh, the leader of the faction is old Silas Crossman. Was he present that first night when the bodies were found? Yes, uh, yes he was, but uh, you can't suspect him, uh, Mr. Cranston. Uh, old Silas is one of our leading citizens. Uh, his family uh, was one of the founders of the village. Tell me, Sheriff, this goes to Sir Roger... Just where and when has he been seen? Well, he's uh, always been seen in the old meeting hall, uh, usually at the hour of midnight. Very well. Then we shall seek out the ghost of Sir Roger Mathis this very night. Lamont, I don't think the ghost will ever appear. The evening isn't over yet, Margot. Not frightened, are you? No. Of course not. I mean, not very. Listen. Midnight. The hour for the ghost to appear. Sir Roger! Sir Roger! If you are within sound of my voice, I defy you to show yourself. No one answers. Give him time, Margot. Give him a chance Lamont, to... Lamont, listen. That did it. He's heard me. He's coming. Give me that flashlight, Margot. Here. Who called to me? Speak up. Who summoned Sir Roger Mathis? Look there, Lamont. I did, Sir Roger. That face, it's not human. Why art thou here? We've heard a lot about you, Sir Roger. The fear you've created in this village. Thou but... art fools. The fate of the others will be thy fate as well. We have no fear. Come ahead. Begin your destruction. I'm most curious to learn your powers. I select the time for my revenge. I see. Then you're not going to harm us tonight. Is that it? Very well. If you won't come to us, then we shall come to you. Stay where thou art. I warn thee. Come on, Margo. We're going up to meet Sir Roger right now. Hurry, Margo. Up these stairs. 
Well, Sir Rod, he's gone. But where? I have chosen not to meet thee at this moment. Where is that voice coming from? Listen to me, both of you. He must have gone to a secret panel. Thou hast defied the laws of Sarajah Mathis, and by my sword thou shalt die for it. The next morning, Lamont Cranston and the lovely Margolaine returned to the town meeting place to try and discover the origin of their mysterious visitor from the previous night. The hall certainly looks different in the daylight, eh, Margo? Sure does. Did you say anything to the sheriff about last night's encounter, Lamont? No. I thought it best not to mention it to anyone for the present. We do know now, though, that Sir Roger proved himself to be a very human ghost. Yes. But who is he? And what his motives might be remain to be discovered. And how he got away. Yes, and that's what we must find out right now. We're looking for a secret panel... I think you start at this end, Margot, and I'll look for him down by the speaker stand. If you find anything suspicious, call me. Well, this panel seems solid enough. No sign of any... Good morning. Oh! Sorry, I I didn't mean to frighten you. (laughs) It's all right. I just didn't hear you coming. Uh, I'm Edward Darrow. And I'm Lamont Cranston. And this is my companion, Margot Lane. The sheriff tells me you've been trying to track down our elusive ghost. I'll be relieved if you succeed. Why is that? Well, I'm more or less the leader of the group who wished to open this meeting all to the public. And most of the rest of the group has met death at the hands of the ghost. And you feel you might be next? Yes, sir. Have there been any attempts on your life? Not yet, knock on wood. Although... My uncle probably wishes there had been. Your uncle? Silas Crossman. He heads the opposition group. He's plenty sore at me. I see. So, have you discovered any clues to the killings yet? Not yet. We were just looking around in here. Having heard of the ghosts, and knowing that all good ghosts use secret passageways and such, we hope we might stumble on one. Say, perhaps I can help you. How? Well, I'm to be in charge of the restoration work in this hall if it's ever to be open to the public. And I have a sheaf of the original plans at home. Oh, could we see them? Sure. I could bring them back by here tonight. Oh, and by the way, I trust no word of this will get back to my uncle Silas. He might, well... No, we shan't mention it to anyone. Thank you. Well, until tonight. Goodbye. 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 Margot. I think it's time we investigated Mr. Silas Crossman. I'm going to pay him a call right now as the Shadow. (laughs) What was that? Sorry to interrupt your letter writing, Mr. Crossman. Who are ye? Why does thy voice come from? I am right beside you, Silas Crossman. Don't trouble yourself to look for me. No human eyes have ever seen me. I am called the Shadow. What brings thee into my house? I am in search of a ghost, Silas Crossman. The ghost of Sir Roger Mathis. And I believe you know all about him. I know nothing more than the others. Why are you opposed to the opening of the old meeting hall? Because the hall belongs to those of the village. For hundreds of years it has been that way. This shall not desecrate an ancient tradition. Those are the same words used by the ghost of Sir Roger. I am aware of that. People aren't going to continue to believe that a ghost did the killings in this village. Soon they will know a human hand was responsible. And their suspicion, Silas Crossman, will fall upon you. And why me? Because of your behaviour, the way you live, the ancient relics in this house, 
the quill pen you write with. In your speech, you use the antiquated thee and thou, just as the ghost of Sir Roger does. That proves nothing. You're wrong. That evidence alone would be enough to convict you in a court of law. Now tell me, what do you know about these killings? Nothing. I know nothing. Very well. I've given you your chance. Let me warn you, Silas Crossman, if you are the killer, you will pay for your crime. Lamont, do you think Mr. Darrell will keep his word? I believe so, Margot. Good. I shouldn't like to spend many more nights in this eerie old hall. Well, if everything works out as... Listen! Could it be Sir Roger again? We'll soon find out. Hello there. Sorry I'm late. Oh, it's you, Mr. Darrow. You gave us quite a scare. <laughs> Sorry. That seems to be a habit with me, doesn't it? Did you bring the plans? Uh, yes, two sets. Here, take one. Thank you. I think we'd better go right to work. We can each start at one end of the wall, Mr. Darrow. Uh, Miss Lane, perhaps you could stay with me. You see, my eyesight is rather poor, and in this dim light, I... I'll go with you, Mr. Darrow. Thank you. Here are the plans, and here is my flashlight, Miss Lane. Call out to me if you find anything. We can start right here, Miss Lane. Do the plans indicate anything? Well, there does seem perhaps to be one thing that would be right about here. Mr. Darrell, look, this panel, it moves. Why, so it does. I'll see if I can get a hold of it. There. Why, it's opening. We must call Lamont. Shut up! Let me go! If you're so anxious to meet Sir Roger, I'll take you to him. Let me go! Lamont, help! Margot! In you go! <laughs> Where are we? Where have you taken me? A secret compartment beneath the meeting hall, known only to me. Let me out of here! <laughs> Cry out louder if you wish. No one will hear you. These walls were made especially thick to muffle sound. They had a purpose in building them that way in the olden days. What do you mean? This room was an ancient torture chamber. Look about you. See the press? The spike-studded pit? Excellent for entertaining, don't you think? Then it was you who has been impersonating Sir Roger. That is correct. But why did you bring me here? Do you see the fire that I have started in this forge? See the white-hot branding iron I placed in it? Why? Why are you doing this? In the days of the Puritans, they had a very satisfactory method for dealing with meddlers. They branded them upon the forehead. No! No! Soon, young lady, you shall fear the searing agony of that branding iron biting into your flesh. You're mad! You won't feel the pain too long, because I have another treat for you. The press... The torture press. Keep it away from me. Drop that iron, Mr. Darrow. Who was that? Release the girl. No. Let go of my arm. Let me finish my work. There. Your work is finished, Mr. Darrow. Who are you? <laughs> I am the shadow, and I'll put an end to your career of torture and murder. But why did you do it? Why did you kill those men? Because of my uncle, Silas Crossman. I hate him and all that he stands for. But now I've had my revenge. He will be blamed. He will be held for the murders. What makes you think that? Because none of us are leaving this building alive. Look out! He's tipping over the fire in the forge. Don't do that, Darrow. It's done now, Shadow. Look, the flames are already licking up the walls. This old hall is a tinderbox. It'll burn in no time. The fire is catching all over the room. What are you going to do now, Shadow? We're getting out of here. Go to that door at the end of the room, Margot. If you can, get up to the doors. You have a chance to escape. Hurry! (coughs) 
Hold on to my hand, Margot. <coughs> the smoke will not. I, I can't see. You've got to keep going. <coughs> we should be near the door. <coughs> Mott, the smoke. Margot. Oh. I'll carry you. We haven't far to <coughs> go. <coughs> Only have to make it <coughs> to the door. The <coughs> door. Wait, wait. This is it. I found the door. Margot, we've made it. Oh, oh, what? Oh. How do you feel, Margot? Better. Thank you. Take a look at that old meeting hall. It's a mass of flames. Yes, we got out just in time. Any sign of Darrow? No, and there's no hope for him now. Look up in the belfry of the meeting house. There's someone standing up there. Lamont, it's Darrow. Yes. Look at him. He's waving his arms. He's shouting something to the crowd. Lamont, he's going to jump. Turn your head, Margot. <sighs> the weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> We will continue with our presentation of tonight's adventure with the shadow after this important message. Hey, look at this brochure. Is that the Crichton Players' season lineup? Indeed it is. Rats, we just missed Bye Bye Birdie. Well, tell me what's coming up for the rest of 2015. Well, let's see. Moon Over Buffalo is in just a few weeks, and Meet Me in St. Louis for the holidays. Let me see that. Wow, 2016 also brings the hilarious murder at the Howard Johnson's, as well as William Shakespeare's timeless tale, Romeo and Juliet, and the unparalleled smash musical, Chicago, and the riveting Agatha Christie classic, The Mousetrap. For more information on discount season tickets, go to owentheater.com. That's O-W-E-N-T-H-E-A-T-R-E dot com. Be sure to join us as the hits keep coming at the Owen Theater. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? The shadow knows. <laughs> the shadow. The mystery man who strikes terror into the heart of every sharpster, lawbreaker, and criminal. Tonight's episode, The Death Triangle. On this day... December 22nd, 1913, by order of the authority of Devil's Island, you, Pierre Maton, are hereby sentenced to 100 days in confinement solitaire and a hundred lashes in the presence of the assembled prisoners as a warning to all who would attempt to escape. Let the punishment begin. I will find the devil who betrayed me. One. I will learn his name. Two. I will kill him. Three. I will find him and kill him. Four. I will kill him. Five. I will kill him. Six. I will kill him. Seven. I will kill him. Eight. I will kill him. Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt this program of organ music to bring you a special news flash from our affiliated press service. New York, December 12th, 1937. The shadow has been found. 
Dr. James Evans, world-famous child surgeon, told reporters this afternoon that a wounded man who claimed to be the shadow forced his way into Dr. Evans' private clinic and, at the point of a gun, forced him to remove a bullet. The wounded man then revealed that he was none other than that mysterious character who has waged a one-man war against crime, the shadow. Before Dr. Evans could report the case to the police, however, the shadow mysteriously disappeared. The famous surgeon believes the shadow has little chance of surviving his wound. Our organ recital now continues. Hello, Dr. Evans speaking. <laughs> Dr. Evans, the man you claim to have operated upon was a fake. The real shadow has not been wounded. The shadow? You are the shadow? Yes, Dr. Evans. You don't seem surprised. I'm not. I've been hoping that you'd get in touch with me. That statement I issued was false. False? Come now, Dr. Evans, a man of your high standing in the medical world does not issue false statements without very grave reason. There was a very grave reason. I need your help. An old acquaintance of mine, Raymond Dubril, the financier, has received a death threat. Have him notify the police. No, he refuses to do that. Then let him take the consequences. Unless, Dr. Evans, have you also received a death threat? Yes, I have. Before I made this call, I investigated your past, Dr. Evans. My past is a matter of public knowledge. You were once a political prisoner on Devil's Island. You escaped 20 years ago with three other men, Raymond Dubril, the banker, and Pierre Martin, the concert pianist. Yes, but our convictions were reversed by a high court a year after we escaped. I know it was proved that the three of you were innocent, but what about the fourth man who escaped with you, the murderer? Doug Corvey. He was caught and sent back to Devil's Island. After the escape, one of you betrayed him to the police. I don't believe that. Why else should he mark you for death? Then you know Corvey escaped from Devil's Island a second time, six months ago. Yes, Dr. Evans. Then you're interested. You'll help? Yes, I will help but only because your life is in danger, Doctor. The world can ill afford to lose the skill and genius that has saved the lives of countless children. You overestimate my importance, Shadow, but will you help? Yes. When and where does Corvée's warning say he will strike first? At De Brill's Long Island estate, tonight. How do you know this warning came from Corvée? Dubril received a miniature musical box in the shape of a coffin in the mail this morning. A musical coffin? Yes, and when the lid of the coffin is raised, the music box plays a tune. A tune Dubril, Martin, Corvée, and myself whistled as a danger signal when we were planning our escape from Devil's Island. Where is Dubril, Dr. Evans? At his Long Island estate. Martin is staying with him, and I'm driving out there to spend the night. I'd hope you'd come and help. I will help you, Dr. Evans. Tell Deville and Martin that the shadow will be there tonight. <laughs> Good afternoon, Miss Lane. Is Mr. Cranston at home? Uh, No, Miss Lane, he's not. Do you know where I can reach him? Uh, He may be at his club. 
No, I've tried there. Well, his office? Yes, everywhere. Nobody's seen him all day. Well, is there anything I can do? Be sure and stay here in case he comes home. I'll call you on the phone later. Yes, miss. I've got to find him. I've got to. I've just got to. <laughs> Dr. Evans knows more than he told the newspapers. His office said he might be at home. Aww. Number 33, yes, this is it. Oh, Lamont, I knew they'd shoot you someday. Yes, miss? Is Dr. Evans here? I must see him. I beg your pardon, miss, but are you another reporter? Yes, and I must see Dr. Evans. It's important. It's a matter of life or death. I'm sorry, miss, but Dr. Evans has nothing to say to the press. He's not at home. But I must see him. I must find him. I'm sorry. That car. That's Dr. Evans' car. Yes, miss. Where's he going? I'm not at liberty to say, miss. Oh, never mind. I'll find out myself. Taxi. Taxi! What? Okay, miss. Where to? Follow that big black limousine. The one with the green cross on the license plate. That's a doctor's car, miss. We have to break a lot of traffic laws if it goes through red lights. Oh, never mind. I'll pay the fines. But don't lose sight of that car for a minute. Okay, lady. But this is going to be one fast ride. Driver, driver, slow down. That car is turning into the state. What do you want me to do? Go through the gates after it? No, no, no. Stop here. Okay. Here's five dollars. Hey, thanks, miss. I wonder if this is just a wild goose chase. Lamont couldn't be way out here. Not if he's wounded, dying. That car, it sounded like. Oh, but it couldn't be. It is. Sounds like someone's getting out of the car. Is that whistling? It's Lamont. Lamont! Margot, Margot, what in heaven's names are you doing out here? Oh, Lamont, then it wasn't true. You weren't shot. Dr. Evans didn't operate on you. Oh, so you heard that news flash too? The papers are full of it. I tried to find you at your office, at home, at your club, everywhere. I'm sorry, Margot. I should have known you'd worry, but I've had a very busy afternoon. Um, how did you get out here? I followed Dr. Evans' car. He just drove through those gates. What's going on, Lamont? Are you trying to find out why he said he'd operated on the shadow? Is someone impersonating you? No, no. Dr. Evans did that knowing I'll get in touch with him. He needs my help in a very special manner. But why? Is someone after him? Threatening him? Yes. Also the owner of this estate, the banker de Brill, and Martin, the concert pianist. And you're going to help them? I'm interested in helping Evans. He's a great doctor and a great humanitarian. His life is in danger. Lamont, now that I'm here, is there anything I can do? Yes, Margot. Wait in my car. Keep your eye on the house. If you see a light go on and off twice in one of the windows, drive to the nearest payphone. Notify the state police to come to the De Brille estate. I'll watch for the signal. Fine. I suppose there's no use my asking you to be careful. Mm. No, Margot. But I'll try. I'll try to avoid really putting Dr. Dr. Evans to the trouble of removing a bullet from the shadow. Debril, stop pounding on the table and cursing Corvée. Oh, that's all very well for you to say, Evans. Your turn hasn't come, but it will. If we three sitting here, you, or me, or Martin, don't get Corvée when he comes here tonight, you will be next on his list. You, or Martin. Don't concern yourself with my fate, Dubril. I am not afraid of Corvée. Oh, you'll change your mind if he manages to kill me, Martin. <laughs> I wonder what it's like to die. What do you think, Dubril? Or do you ever think of anything but your fat stomach and your money? Why, you... Gentlemen, this is no time to argue. I have something more important to tell you. What is it, Evans? I heard you had quite an experience today. Operated on this man who calls himself the Shadow. Yes, uh, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. 
Ah, there's a man, Dubril. The Shadow. He might save you from Corvée. Oh, what could he do? I've had the best private detectives in the country trying to find some trace of Corvée ever since he escaped from Devil's Island again six months ago. By the way, Dubril, I've always wondered, who tipped off the police when Corvée was hiding after he helped us escape 20 years ago? Corvée was a murderer. We were innocent men. And also, who betrayed me, Dubril, the time I tried to escape alone, the first time? Martin, Dubril, now listen to me. A moment ago, we were talking about the shadow. Well, he isn't dying, and I didn't operate on him. I announced that, hoping the real shadow would get in touch with me. Did he? Yes. He's coming here tonight to help us. I've always been curious to see this shadow. You won't see him. No man has ever seen him. But he'll be here. Ha, oh, heavens. For a man of intelligence, you're talking like a fool. The age of ghosts and mystic presences. You're wrong, Debril. You're wrong. Because I am a doctor, I can readily accept the fact that the shadow is a master of the powers of mental suggestion, of mass hypnosis. Recent experiments have proven conclusively that... Rubbish! <laughs> Allow me to convince him, Dr. Evans. What? What was that? Who spoke then? The shadow, Dubril. You do not accept the theory of my power of invisibility, but perhaps you will accept the fact for I am here. Sit down, Debril. You look rather pale. If I am to help you, you will all sit down. Sit at that table there. I understand there is little time to lose. I must know the whole story. The truth, if I am to help you. Do as the shadow says. Sit there, Martin. And you there, Debril. Well, why don't you talk back, Dubril? Be quiet, Martin. Dr. Evans, I will help you if I can. But there is one gap in the chain of events leading up to this moment. I'll tell you anything I know, Shadow. Then tell me this. When and under what circumstance did Corvée first threaten your lives? It was the last day we spent in the open boat in which we escaped from Devil's Island 20 years ago. The storms had blown us off our course. Our food was gone. Our water was exhausted. Corvée, the only one who knew how to navigate was, well, he was dying slowly from hunger and thirst. Water, water. Oh, be quiet, Corvée. There is no water. Lying to bed, all of you. You've been drinking my share. Give me that bucket. Give me a drink from that bucket. Don't do that. Salt water will kill him. What does it matter, Dr. Evans? Seventeen days in this open boat. Nights of storm and days of blazing heat. Water, water. I'm dying, I tell you. Dying. You're not giving me my share. You're stealing my water. Where will you be if I die? I'm the only one who knows navigation. Be patient, Corvée. It may rain tonight. Ah, we may as well be back on Devil's Island. At least there was bread and water there. Bread, bread and crust. Just a crust of bread and water. Water. Uh, there's no bread, Corvée. The last crust went three days ago. You're cheating me. Cheating me. You only brought me along to steal a boat, and now you're starving me to death. You don't want me to live, but I will live. I'll get you for this. I'll live to kill every one of you for this. You, Dubril. You, Martin. You, Evans. Oh, shut him up, Evans. You're a doctor. You know what to do. Look! Martin, Debril, seagulls! What does it matter? We have no gun. I know, but don't you see? Seagulls never fly far away from land or ship. Look! Look to the west. It's land. Land at last. You're right. They're there to the southwest. You can see the sun on the other mountains. We're, we're saved. Free at last. Cor Corvée, Corvée, sit up. S sit up. Look, we've sighted land. There'll be food and water. Plenty for everybody. You try to kill me. Stop me to death. But I'm going to live. I'm going to live until the last one of you is dead. Dead. So, you see, that's how it all began. And now Corvée is free and out to get us, Shadow. 
But what makes you so sure it is Corvée? Well, it couldn't be anyone else. It's Corvée, all right. He sent two brills that sing on the table. That oblong box? Yes, Shadow. Notice its shape. It's a miniature coffin, beautifully carved. Corvée was a woodcarver. He was always handy with a knife. But still it does not follow that he is the one. Except for one thing, Shadow. When the lid of the coffin is raised, it's a music box. And that tune it's playing is the warning signal we used while planning our escape from Devil's Island. Remember, the only four of us that do it, Debril, Corvée, Martin, and myself. Stop it, Evans. Stop that cursed thing. Stop it, I tell you, I can't stand it. So, you have a conscience, eh, Debril? That danger refrain recalls the past, doesn't it? Stop talking about it! It looks as though Corvée meant business, doesn't it? Don't sit there conniving over me. You forget your turn maybe next. Maybe tonight even. I am not forgetting anything, Debril. You better steady yourself, Debril. I'll get you a drink. Oh, never mind. Here's the decanter. I'll pour it myself. Oh! That tune! Where is he coming from? I smashed the coffin. Good heavens! Gabriel, it's the decanter in your hand. Ah! Someone, someone changed the decanter. Corvée, he did it. He's here. He's been in this house tonight. Gabriel, where are you going? To my room. I don't trust anybody. I'll be safe there behind locked doors. And if Corvée comes, I'll be ready for him. Wait, Gabriel, wait. Let him go, Dr. Evans. He shouldn't be left alone. Corvée may carry out his threat. Are you <coughs> sure it is Corvée? What do you mean? It must be. It couldn't be anybody else. The coffins at the canter are his warning. I know. But you said the four of you knew the signal. Are you sure it isn't one of you? Of course not. I thought you said the shadow was here to help us. I am. But I am content to let events lead themselves to a logical conclusion. You mean you won't use your power to save us from him? I shall use my power at the moment it is required, Dr. Evans. Right now, for instance, look on the table. There's a note where the decanter was standing. Good heavens! Corvée has been here. Listen to this, Martin. You are the first, and you will die tonight, Raymond de Brille. <sighs> de Brille, de Brille, wake up. I've come for you. <laughs> so you've come, Corvée. Why, you poor deluded fool. You think I'd let you kill me in my sleep? I've been awake, waiting here in the dark for you to come. I will strike this match. Ah, little light. So, you've grown a beard since I saw you last, Corvée. And your hair is grey. That gun on your hand won't save you, Jubril. If I die, it will take you with me. Listen, Corvée. I didn't steal your food in the open boat. I swear it. Oh, you also betrayed me to the police. You told them where to find me. And I am not the only one you betrayed, am I, Jubril? You betrayed Martin the time he tried to escape alone. Didn't you, Jubril? Yes, yes, but what do you care, Corvée? He wouldn't take me with him, but I did not betray you. Have you paid Martin for those hundred lashes and those hundred days of bread and water he got because you betrayed him? Oh, he doesn't know. He will never know. It was I. Do Bill, remember how we passed the long days in that open boat throwing knives? Don't raise that knife, Corvée. We got so good we seldom missed. I'll shoot if you move. But Martin was the best. You may shoot me, Dubril, but my knife won't miss. Wait. Wait a minute, Corvée. I will make a deal with you. Listen, Corvée. You're out to get Evans and Martin, too. If you throw that knife, I will shoot you, and you will never get them. You would help me kill Evans? I know he's here in the house. Yes, yes, yes. I hate Evans and Martin, too. I will help you get them. <laughs> so... You would betray Dr. Evans to save yourself, Dubril? The shadow. 
Corvette, don't be afraid. He's only a man. By some trick, he can make himself invisible. But he's flesh and blood. Quick, lock the door. We'll deal with him first. He won't get out. Now, now, Shadow, what can you do to stop us? Speak up. I dare you to speak. Listen where his voice comes from, Dubril. Then shoot quickly. No, no, no. The shot would bring Evan the Martin. Throw your knife. Make him speak. I won't miss. Speak up, Shadow. We will find you anyway. You can't get out. I am here. In the corner. In the far corner. Throw your knife, Corvée. <laughs> oh, you missed. But he was there. No. Only my voice was there. Throw your voice. He's there in front of you, Dubril. Shoot, shoot. <laughs> yes, I will shoot now. Yes, I will shoot, but not the shadow. He came here to help us catch you, Corvée and Diaz. Your knife, it's gone. Now, Corvée, you are helpless, and now I'll deal with you. You treacherous snake, you fool. You think I carry only one knife? This one is for you. <gasps> oh, you devil. But I take you with me, Corvée. To Brill, to Brill, to Brill. Open the door. To Brill, to Brill. To Brill is dead, Dr. Evans. Is? Corvée kept his word? Where is he? Look there, on the floor by the window. Corvée? That's Corvée? Dubril tried to save his life by promising to help that man kill you. Dubril? Dubril offered to help Corvée kill me? Look closely, Dr. Evans. Remove the grey wig and the false beard. It's... It's... it's Martin. Yes, Martin, dressed as Corvée. Still alive, breathing. Get away from me, Evans. Don't touch me. I hate you. I hate you both. But why? Why did you do this, Pierre? Why? I hated the Brill because he betrayed me on Devil's Island. I hated you, Evans, because you have got the things that I always wanted. Success, fame, glory. It was I who sent the musical coffin, the warning note. I knew you'd think it was Corvée. I got to Brill, but Corvée will get you, Evans. He's after you. He will get you. He will kill you. Martel, not breathing, dead. Yes, Dr. Evans, he's dead. You are quite safe now. You forgot Corvée. No, Dr. Evans. I knew when I phoned you today that it was not Corvée who sent the musical coffin. What? I knew it was not Corvée. It had to be Martin or Dubril. Why didn't you stop them? Martin or Dubril were both criminals, plotting to kill you. If I had stopped them, your life would have been in danger as long as you lived. Hating you always for having obtained the things that life denied them. But you forgot, Shadow. Corvée may find me. Succeed where Martin failed. Never. I learned the whole history of all of you before I saw you. Yes? Everything, Dr. Evans. Your escape from Devil's Island after Debril's betrayal of Martin. That resulted in a hundred lashes. His resolve for vengeance. From the authorities of Devil's Island, I learned the truth about Corvée's last escape. Yes, yes, I see now why he hated us. But what about Corvée? You are safe now, Dr. Evans. Safe from Corvée. The chain of logic is complete. Three months ago... A bleached skeleton was found on a deserted beach at Trinidad. It has just been identified as the body of Corvée. The weed of crime bears bitter fruit. 
crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us this evening for this bone-chilling season premiere of the Crichton Players Vintage Radio Hour right here at the Owen Theatre. Special thanks go to director O.A. Melvin and the cast and crew of Moon Over Buffalo for letting us borrow their stage tonight. This madcap comedy opens on Friday, October 16th and runs weekends through November 1st. More details on tickets for our Crichton Players season can be found at owentheater.com. Tonight's technical credits go to Dick Schistler as sound engineer, who also acted as producer for Lone Star Internet Radio. Our sound effects were performed live and from scratch without the use of any recordings by Donna Nelson and Belle Ledeen. Commercial announcers were Ken Mann and Rebecca McDowell. Our live music was improvised tonight by Lori Shones. And tonight's episode was directed by Dale Trimble. Our cast for The Ghost Walks Again included Belle Ledeen as Grace, Stephen Paredes as Sam and Harvey, Landon Edwards as Mathis and Darrow, Baron Dan Jackson as Stebbins and the Sheriff, Ken Mann as Silas, and Rebecca McDowell as Margot Lane. Cast for The Devil's Triangle included Steve Paredes as Martin and the Taxi Driver, Landon Edwards as the Butler, Baron Dan Jackson as Dr. Evans, Ken Mann as Corvée, Rebecca McDowell as Dubril, Belle Ledeen as Margot Lane, and playing Lamont Cranston, a.k.a. The Shadow, for both episodes, Jeff Evans. Series producer on behalf of the Crichton Players was Timothy Egger. The Crichton Players, visiting Vintage Radio Theater, was originally created as the Players Theater Company, Old Time Radio Hour by Craig Campobella and Dick Schistler. This episode of the Crichton Players Vintage Radio Theater was performed live in the Owen Theater in partnership with Lone Star Internet Radio in Conroe, Texas, and it aired on September 27, 2015. It was also recorded for Encore Broadcasts. Visit IRLoneStar.com every month for freshly archived programs like Suspense, which is now available on demand for your listening pleasure. If you are an actor in the Conroe or greater Houston area, you are invited to audition for our next episode. The audition will be in the Owen Theater on Wednesday, October 14th. This upcoming production is a double feature of Quiet, Please, just in time for Halloween. Our program airs live from the Owen Theater on Sunday, October 25th at 7 p.m. In the meantime, be sure to listen for us every Sunday night at 7 p.m. on Lone Star Internet Radio. Again, our thanks to you for joining us during our season premiere from the Glittering Arts District of downtown Conroe, Texas. This is your series host, Dennis Nelson, wishing you a very pleasant evening. That was the recreation of two of the Shadow episodes. The Ghost Walks Again was originally broadcasted on March 16, 1941 and The Death Triangle was originally broadcasted on December 12, 1937. These two episodes are preserved, but it's nice to know that there is a recreation of the old radio scripts. These two episodes were recreated on September 27, 2015. Well, that is it for this hour, but we will look at a couple episodes of suspense for our October Halloween theme in the next hour. Stay tuned.